Uh, okay. Today is Thursday, January the 7th, 2010, and this is the start of an interview with Mr. David Tank at the Macomb County Catholic Services located at 15945 Canal Road, Clinton Township, Michigan. Mr. Tank is 59 years old, and he was born February the 19th, 1950. Mr. Tank currently resides at 48590 Sandifer Court in Shelby Township, Michigan. My name is Dave Brousseau and I will be the interviewer and Mr. Navitkus will be the videographer. Mr. Tank, would you state for the record the branch of service that you served? Uh, U.S. Army. All right, Dave, can, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself, where you were born, your family? Um, I'm the middle kid. I have two younger brothers. I have an older brother and an older sister. I grew up in a little small town called Elmont. Um, and in the 50s, 60s, went to school there. I'm the only family member that served in the military. Neither one of my brothers uh, didn't serve. My father never served. Um, he'd be 100 years old if he was still alive today, but uh, he was, said he was too young for World War I, too old for World War II, I guess. So, um, I got drafted in the Army right after I got out of school, high school, in March, and I served uh, only 20 months. Um, got released early because people coming back from Vietnam. They didn't have enough room for all the soldiers in the post anymore, so I had a choice. I could uh, join the Guard, get out. I decided to take four months out early. So, and, uh, same as in Vietnam. I never served a whole year over there. I got bounced around to two different outfits, the 25th and 23rd Infantry. And I only served nine months, three days, 11 and a half hours. I've been never so grateful to get out of one place in all my life. Exactly. Um, for what I did in the um, in Vietnam, I was uh, just an infantry run for a while. Then I became a radio operator. Um, I kind of liked that. I was the uh, company radio. We'd switch the other, there was two of us, we'd switch back and forth. Every time went out, one of us had the company, one had a battalion. So, and for the majority of my time, I was radio operator. And, um, Let, let's go back a minute. When you got drafted, were you aware that that was going to happen, and how did you feel about that? Well, I remember they were calling off the birth dates, okay? Just number one, my birthday was 19, so I knew I was going to end up getting drafted. And I did. Right after in March of 1970, I had draft March 9th. Um, at the time, I didn't know where I was going. I never thought about going to Vietnam. I was just a kid, you know. We were playing with all the kids. We never really um, worried about that too much. So I figured, well, I'm going to go in the Army to get it over with. And I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky for basic, and then Fort Polk, Louisiana for advanced training. Um, Let's go back to the basic and Fort Knox. What was that like? That was nice. That was fairly new. You know, we had new barracks. I kind of liked it there. And uh, um, I may say this was a new experience for me and a lot of other young kids there and stuff. I, I remember we were, um, there was 200 and some of us there. So those with the light beard shaved that night, those with the heavier beard had shaved in the morning. So we just have enough room to get everybody else and they could get breakfast and get going. I mean, there's packed houses and stuff. Um, Do you remember was, anything that went on during basic? Pardon? Do you remember anything? Uh, just the training and stuff. There was nothing, and I can recall that uh, uh, in basic training that was... Uh, Any instructors stick in your mind? 
just the one drill sergeant, and uh, he just made sure we did everything correctly and by the book and all that. And I remember I had my belt on wrong, and I got yelled at for that. <laughs> and uh, so, but when we went to advanced training in Fort Polk, okay, this is something that. Um, Drill sergeant says, I'm going to call out 18 people. And I didn't mean to just fall out and I call your name. And I was one of them. Oh, Lord, what's going on? Are you in trouble? No, you're going to go take a military driver's test. Oh, okay. So we go take the test and all that and we get back. And uh, he comes out the next day and yell and scream at everybody, you know, dumb motherfuckers and all that. How come you can pass the driving test? Only me and one other guy passed out of 18. So I spent most of my time driving in, in vans down there, just doing fuel operations. What was so hard about the test? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't was ask the heavy equipment or just a... Uh, what we were driving, just a half a Jeep, and that was it. And uh, I had a military driver's license for everything but a tank. I could drive anything else. And... Uh, I don't know why they didn't pass or what the deal was with it, but i tell you, the sergeant was not happy at all because mm -hmm. I had to double up with another outfit I uh, called a water tanker. So I had water for breakfast and lunch and dinner and drinking and all that. So I had to make two or three trips a day when they were on the field. So I never really had much training out there. I didn't have any training with 45 because they were so short of drivers. And why they failed, I have no idea. I, I, to this day, I... Was I that know. the only vehicle that you drove? In the United States, I drove that in a Jeep. I had a license. I'd go down there and get them out. And, uh, they had, I wanted to drive a tank, but they wouldn't let me because they didn't have a license. So, just so I could drive one. Uh, and when I got over, over Vietnam, we didn't, I didn't drive anything. They yeah, always just doing helicopters and stuff. Were you aware that being assigned to Fort Polk meant you were going to Vietnam? No. No, I didn't, uh, wasn't aware of that until I got done and uh, then I found out where, where we were going. I said, you're going to be going, to, I'm going to go home for a week. I believe that's what it was, a week. And you flew to Oakland Army Terminal, California. So how long had you been gone by the time you went home for that week? I was gone about three months. So how was that when you got back home? Oh, it was great. I was, uh, um, great to get back home for a while and visit everybody. And then uh, um, now I was married and uh, tell my wife, I'm going to go to Vietnam. She wasn't happy with that. I imagine. And, uh, I said goodbye to my friends, and uh, I said, hope I'll keep writing and, mm -hmm. and uh, letters. Um, uh, you said you were married. When did you get married? I got married just before I went into service. Mm -hmm. But it didn't have any children. We decided to uh, wait till I get out before we had any children. So. And, uh, my wife is going to school, and uh, you know, I went to serve there. So. What did you think about going to Vietnam? Did, were well, you aware of what was going on over there? Well, when, when they told me I was going and I found out, oh, we're, we're playing like war, okay. Ooh, that doesn't, you know, didn't sound too good. Uh, but anyway, I just, hopefully my training would keep me alive, and it did. Um, and we flew over there, we went to, we left Oakland, we had to fly to, Alaska to refuel, then to Japan, and then we landed in Vietnam at 2 in the morning, pitch black, stunk. That's my first remembrance of how stinky it was. And um, going through the... Uh, what did it stink like? It smelled like garbage dump. This reminded me of. Hmm. It smelled rotten, and I could just, you know, I said, geez, is this this place, you know? Because they process you through, you had to get, take all your uh, money you mean you want my money? Oh well, yeah, we're going to give you MPC. What the heck is that? Well, military payment certificates. You didn't, couldn't use any of your, your dollars. Or, and they had a 55-gallon drum where you threw your pennies in. That thing was full. Because they didn't give you, they give you paper money for your coins and everything. They gave you the dollars. So 
got through with that, got assigned to my outfit. Um, Where in Vietnam was this now? This is in my uh, Saigon, Benoit. Benoit. Yeah, it was just in there, and that's where I first, the 25th Infantry Division is my first. Now, and I got there, and the sergeant says, well, they're out in the field right now, and you can take a couple of days off and do whatever you want to do, because when they get back, you'll be going out in the field with them. I said, okay, so I goofed around for a couple of days, and when they got back, and they went out in the field, and I said, oh, what a, what a waking that was, going out there, and uh, um, I didn't realize that uh, diseases, you had to be really careful about getting cut and stuff. And uh, what was the temperature like? It was hot. It was in the hundreds. I remember as we were in the jungle there, and it was very, very warm. And uh, I spent four months of the 25th until they got sent home. And uh, it was the first firefight got into, um, I'm not going to forget that, I just want to think. You're the guy who's about as close to me as you are, he stood up, he took one round right here, and it'll come out over here. And the blood just squirted out of him like a pump, and he died. He couldn't even save his life. And he died instantly, but yeah, it was that close to death right there. Um, and that was a very rude awakening for me. So. What'd you feel about that? Oh, it scared the hell out of me. Um, sitting there and knowing that you can't do anything for him. I mean, you, uh, we had very limited medical stuff, you know, I mean, but he just bled to death so fast, the ministry was gone. And uh, that was, uh, I know that we put him in my poncho and it was just about, on the helicopter. See, I wasn't a radio operator at that time. And, uh, um, you want to this? No. Okay. Um, so that there, that was nice. There, uh, one of the duties we had, we patrolled the Michelin River Plantation. Nice. The Michelin River Plantation? Mm -hmm. We patrolled that. And that was kind of walking them down paved roads and stuff, and, uh, to see all the latex trees, the rubber trees there, the sap and there they're gathering. But uh, we weren't allowed to damage any trees, we couldn't blow any of them up or anything. But every now and then we'd find where they didn't get the sap, and we could make a rubber ball or something, you know, play around with. Um, that was kind of an area down there where there wasn't much in there. Uh, what kind of entertainment did? Did a place like that provide anything? Um, off the they had, every so often you come in for about seven days and then they would have bands from the Philippines come in and uh, play music. Um, other than that, you had a list of man's clubs, no officer's clubs. So um, if you had any money, well, beer was 10 cents, so it wasn't really expensive or anything. You drinks for a quarter. Could spend our late money anywhere, but uh, uh, we had the clubs if you wanted to go to them. We had no movie theaters, and you know, a little entertainment you could get, um, other than uh, have your own music and stuff. Um, <clears throat> How did they pay you so that you could buy stuff? From them? Did they pay you in some form of script? Or yeah, it was called called MPC, military payment certificates. It looked like monopoly money. And uh, that's how they paid you. Most of mine got sent home. Like you say, when you went out to the field, there was no McDonald's to run to, there's no 7 Eleven, but you took everything with you that you figured you were going to need and hope to hell you didn't run out of water because if it was a spot where it was dry, maybe several days before you got any water. Um, I got $265 a month. And then $65 in combat pay, and I think $13 in hazardous duty pay. But that was all tax free, death pay, income taxes, Social Security on that. So, um, that there, and then uh, I, they decided that uh, the 25th was going home. 
All right, well, you're going to get shipped to 23rd Infantry Division. That's not what the team do. That was a real, real rude awakening up there up in the mountains. That was free fire zone. You kill anything that moved, no questions asked. Um, okay, so what got me is that some of the officers who increased the amount of kill we, we had, they were going to give you three days of leave for every confirmed kill. Okay. How do you confirm a kill? Well, with people there, the oh. biggest soldiers and stuff. Okay. I'm the radio operator up there, the 23rd, so. Got a call, hey, we've got a little firefight, and I say, everybody okay? He says, yeah, no wounded or anything, but we got one kill. Oh, all right. You confirm that. Yeah, the guy wants six days leave. I only get three. It was a pregnant woman who wanted another three days. And I'm not going to forget that. He killed a pregnant woman and yep. that's why he wanted six, six days. Yep. Well, it was a free fire zone. All right, there, there, Everybody was considered the enemy there. Regardless of whether you were a little child like this, her, or you people, you are all considered the enemy. And we didn't have to get any authorization to, to kill anybody. But a lot of those, some of those people were the oh, enemy yeah. too, though. Oh, yeah. So you didn't, you know, it was hard to say. Um, that, and then uh, I just called it in. I don't know, I don't remember, I don't think he got the six days, but uh, I mean, I just remember that happening. Um, is, is there a feeling when you get there that you justify shooting anything that moves regardless? I mean, do you ever get to that point, or? Well, it's to the point where, who do you trust? You know, um, you heard so many stories of kids walking up with cans, and then they, there was a bomb, you know, pop and stuff. Because if you were in the, some areas there where there was a lot of civilians, they would be kids running around selling pop and everything, um, food and so on. Um, I guess to some people it's justifiable, but I mean, if you are in a place where you're not supposed to be, and supposedly the civilians knew hey, these are free fire areas, you know, don't don't be in these areas and stuff. Um, I guess it's justifiable. You know. What does mean? Be, what does it mean to be in a fire zone? What does that mean? Free fire zone. Free fire. What that means is that everybody's considered the enemy. Okay? There are no friendlies there. How, how do they determine that? That's the hierarchy determined that. I don't know how they did that, but when I was down in the Mission on Rubber Plantation, that was not a free fire zone. You had to get authorization to shoot, unless you were fired upon. But you just couldn't arbitrarily shoot him over there or her. Or when I was up by the DMZ, yeah, okay, boom, you're dead, you know. We just left you there. Um, So how they determine that, I don't know. I don't know what the qualifications were and stuff. I mean, I'm just enlisted, man. I'm just kept captain. I just did what I'm told. How close did you come to the enemy? How close? Oh, when that one guy got shot there, um, he was just about 50 feet away. They spotted him going down the trail. That was close there. Um, That was close to death. And did you I, ever see anybody that you shot? Yeah. How did you feel about that? Well, I see a lot of bullet holes in them, so everybody could take a shot at it and all that stuff. Uh, um, Not all of the enemy were dressed as enemies. No, so. the, most of what we saw were the guerrillas. They were dressed like. You and me. I mean, you couldn't without them. If they didn't have a weapon, you might not even knew if they, what they were. Um, so it was. It's hard to say, you know. But we just took it as you know our own selves to protect our own lives and stuff. Um, they just shot everybody. So yeah, how, how did know. you feel when you're in that? Old. Well, 
not real good. I, you know, I just, you know, we just shot something. I might have killed. I might have been around and killed this person. I don't know. I mean, um, everybody seen him. Everybody took a shot at him. And, uh, um, and that was it. Um, so in my deal, the radio operator, I had to call all that information in. You know, we killed um, that one lady, and we had another kill at one time. Um, we're taking a break. We've been marching all day. The camp says, okay, everybody sit down. We're going to take a rest. Um, all of a sudden, the 60 gunner opens fire. What the heck is going on? You know, two guys walked up on him. He lets them both have it. And he drops the one guy right there on the trail, backwards like this. And he still had his pack and everything. And they went and got the other guy. He's the guy that full of bullet holes and everything. Uh, tank, roll him over and uh, get his pack off and stuff and see what he's got in there. So I grabbed him, rolled him over, and he didn't have any head on that. Most the rest of this was got blown off. I said, ooh, that's, um, that was enough. I said, I just want to help. Um, even though he was the enemy, I just wasn't really prepared for that. Now, when you go out, are these specific patrols for a purpose, or are you just taking land or taking ground? We are gone out to areas to patrol, we're looking for the enemy, looking for any activities going on. Um, a lot of times we're just patrolling the area, and that's it. We're not uh, um, guarding anything, so to speak. Mm. We got to burn down some houses one time, we were out there, and uh, that was just orders from higher up to do that. They were a band, nobody was living in them, but they didn't want to offer any uh, thing to the enemy, so. Um, when you come back to the base, what, what do you talk about with with your friends? Let's go to the bar and get a beer. Boy, I mean, it's got to be difficult. It would be to talk about, uh, you know, we all made it to get alive again today. And that was got to the point where every morning I got up, um, I survived another day. Because you don't know when you go out there, who knows what's going to happen. Um, I shouldn't be here. I should be dead. Um, when little tennis got French book, same thing I got. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Okay, Dave, uh, I'm going to take the lieutenant's place, the captain. Okay, well, I'm going to get my radio up because I'm the captain's radio. No, you stay here for lieutenant. I'll take the lieutenant's radio up there. They run into a booby trap. He loses both his legs below the knees. The other radio operator was killed and two other people. So, um, when I got the radio message on that, I said, yeah, I pronounced it. Um, I felt really bad about that because, you know, I should have been the one out there, but then again, I'm, I'm alive today. But that's another reason I came close to death. I mean, we've all heard the term friendly fire. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever experienced that? Friendly fire, eh? You climb up on top of the mountain, we're looking down the valley. All right. Cap says we're moving down there tomorrow. We're going to camp here for the night. Okay, I want to get, uh, I want to fire a mortar. We carried a mortar with us down on this little finger of land that came out like this. Okay, let me make sure there's no friendlies or nothing there. I'm not called up. No, there's nobody there. So we left four high explosives and one high phosphorus round off. Well, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam was there. They didn't tell anybody it was there. So we kind of did some damage to them. So what they did, uh, down the end of the valley, is an uh, artillery battery, 155. We started shelling. I got on the radio, cease fire, cease fire. Fortunately, nobody got killed. But I remember the trees flying in the air and the dirt and everything, and that's another close thing to getting, uh, getting killed. Um, but by our own, I mean, we found out, you know, we told them, hey, you guys are shooting up us. Oh wow, and they didn't realize that uh, they were firing at us. So. Um, 
Do you think about these experiences frequently? Not too much. Um, when my grandsons got older, they, they wanted to know about it, so I talked to them about it. Um, Do they know about your time in the service? And yeah. Yeah, and, uh, my sons, they never went in the military. They served too. Uh, um, Do you get a lot of gifts and uh, mail from home? Yeah. Uh, the the my parents would send me a, I call it a care package, had pudding and stuff we couldn't get, and you know, I was so grateful to get that. And I remember I got, uh, I got in trouble one day, I got my ass chewed out, and he says, hey, haven't you been sending letters back home? Yeah, I've been, been sending mail last, I haven't gotten any mail either in the last several days, this is just when I got transferred up to the 23rd. And uh, all of a sudden I got 20 letters. And just the mail finally caught up to me, you know. So, geez, I and uh, and I had a friend of mine uh, when I got trench foot. Uh, he called the senator, and the senator um, got all the army and stuff. And I'm out in the field, and he sent a helicopter to come get me. And it took me in for a couple of days. And this as well, just I told him what was going on. And he, I think Tom was just trying to be you know, helpful to me and everything because I was writing back and forth what was going on. And uh, I got put on a, a base for two weeks just to, you know, so my feet would heal so I could get off my feet. Is and that just from constantly wet feet? Constantly wet feet. I took my one shoe off one day, my foot swelled up, and I couldn't get my boot back on. So I'm hobbling around with one boot on. And went off until I got picked up. And, uh, Do you remember any of the people in your unit? Uh, yeah, the one other radio operator, um, a couple years, about three, four years after I got out, um, I found out where he lived and I went and visited him. He's from Gold Spray, Pennsylvania. And, uh, but he's the only one. Um, but I went and visited all the wounded ones in the hospital and everything. And our captain. Uh, Is there a fear of making close relationships because they may die? And no. Um, but, but he's the only one I really contacted with. Um, a lot of other people, you know, got moved around. Um, <clears throat> I see I went out of Vietnam three months earlier than normal by one day. If I would have come in a day later, I would have stayed here the whole year. But, uh, and so I never really, um, there's about six or seven of them got killed in my outfit. I got pictures of some of them, so. But, uh, now you told us this before, but how long was your stay in Vietnam? Uh, nine months, eleven days, three and a half hours, something like that. And I had to write down to the the hours I was leaving. And uh, um, I when was, did you find out what you were leaving? Well, nobody come out and said anything to you. We had a, like a community board out there, and they would post any information. It was your duty to go out there and read that to keep up on what's happening with the company. And I'm reading. I'm the last guy on the list. I'm going home. Oh, really? And then uh, the next day, he says, "Yep." Yeah. Says, "Here, I got your paperwork for you." And, and uh, said goodbye to everybody. And then I, I left. And, uh, How did you get back home? Fly the same way you came? Yeah. Fly and. Uh, so where did they fly you back to? Um, Seattle Tacoma Airport, in Washington. And then you're on your different. own after that. Uh, yeah. Um, but I want to go back one step here that the, like the SP packs that I tell you we got, you know, everybody got so tired of sea rations and the military food. I bought some local food one day. That put me in the hospital for two weeks. And that's why I have a disability today. Um, it destroyed most of my hearing. Most of your hearing? Really? Mm -hmm. What was it? 
I don't know. I, I they is still listed as an FUO in the medical records. What is the definition of FUO? Fever of an unknown origin. Mm -hmm. I had uh, a temperature of 106 degrees for a while. Um, I remember the doctor saying, um, "I'm glad to see you're back with us." Well, where have I been? Mm -hmm. I was in a coma for three days. And then they were taking, they took all my clothes out, put a fan on me and white towels and alcohol and water and draped them on me to break my temperature down. Plus they gave me a lot of quinine and that's what destroyed the hearing. So, um, they give me a 10% disability. Was there any discussion that that might be connected to some of the chemical warfare they were using? Well, they say no. They say I was never exposed to Agent Orange. And I never remember seeing anything that was defoliated. Um, so I, I know people who had Agent Orange, who they've all died now from that. But uh, um, no, I don't. But uh, I won't eat the local food anymore. <laughs> How are your folks uh, handling your? Uh, service requirement? Um, my dad thought it was a good idea because uh, he was a Boy Scout leader and stuff. And, uh, and my mom um, just hoped I'd make it back alive, and I did. You know, they were all worried that I'd come home in the casket. You know, um, but like I say, we stayed alive and. Uh, how much older was your brother ahead of you? Uh, 11 years older than me. 11 years? Oh. Yeah, I have a sister. And so older he sister. was before Vietnam. Yeah. He didn't get into he didn't get into military either. I mean, I got drafted. I didn't join. And I got a greeting from Uncle Sam. Mm. And then, like I say, my dad. Uh, he said he was just uh, too young for World War One. He was born in 1909, and too old for World War Two. And then my other two brothers, um, they never got uh, drafted or joined or anything. Did you ever have a chance to get into this USO? Yep, yeah, that was um, get there every chance I could get because he got a hamburger, he got some normal food, you know. And uh, every time we could get to one, I would. Um, Any I, performers that were that were uh, that came on base? Uh, uh, Bob Hope was there. Um, I almost got to go see him, but uh, I ended up on the field anyway. So he's the only American one I know of. Um, but I see the bands we had; they were from the, either the Philippines or they weren't from the United States. That I, that I got access to. Um, I see what entertainment do we entertain ourselves, played cards, um, went to the bar, talked about what's going on, and you know, hopefully everybody was be all right. And did you get a leave of some kind? What did you do with that? I went to Hawaii. Oh, really? I leave, and uh, we could go there. I couldn't go to the United States. You couldn't go back to the States. Hawaii is the only country, so I've been a week there, um, and I left and went back. <coughs> um, what did it cost you for a trip from Vietnam to Hawaii? Nothing. Oh, what, did you just take a transport or something? Yeah, a military flight. Mm -hmm. It's all arranged by the military. You have to put in for a time. You had to have at least six months there before you could get a week, so my first six months I just took a week. and. So whatever you spend, wherever you go, is you had your own spending money, and you saved up your your military pay to take with you to spend. Um, my wife made arrangements for uh, my parents bought her a plane ticket, and she got the hotel and stuff. So I got to see her, and then we had to go back. Um, um, what was I, that like? Uh, how long well, had you had not seen your wife? It was just great. Um, be in an area where you know I'm not going to get shot at. I'm going to have some decent food to eat. A nice place to sleep, sit on the ground, sit up on an anthill, instead of getting stepped on by who knows what career at night. Um, 
I had my hair full of ants one day because I slept on an anthill. I didn't know. It was the middle of the night. Um, I didn't want to leave, but I had no other choice. So. Um, when I got out of Vietnam, I didn't call anybody until I got back to the States. Huh. I was going to surprise everybody. Couldn't get a hold of a soul. Tried to get a hold of my wife, my friends, nobody's home. Now what do I do? You know, so finally I called my friend's dad. And uh, he found them, and uh, so I got home at 8 o'clock the next day. Just take a flight to Just take Detroit. a flight. They give you the minute. Well, when you, you got off the plane there, you got clean clothes, food to eat, shower, things, you know, you need medical care, all that was there before you left. Then you got a ride up to the airport. There's a guy there who says, what city do you want to go to? Detroit. Um, U.S. Air has got a flight leaving, so he points you in the right direction to get you on a plane. And I fly standby for twenty dollars, hmm. cheap tickets, you know. And then, uh, so I only got bumped once though, <laughs> the whole time. But uh, they did meet me when I got to Detroit. Oh, great! They were there. And, uh, then I went. Uh, had thirty days leave. And I'm going to go to Fort Carson, Colorado. Great. And they're like, no, no, you're not going there. Where are you going? Um, you're going to Fort Rally, Kansas. What for? Then uh, when I got there, that's why I come with a track driver for that place. I'm going where? To Germany to play war? I just got out of one. I didn't want to go to Germany, but I had to go. And, oh, by the way, before you go, that's when I found out I was getting out four months early, too, but I still had to go to Germany. And I was a track driver over there. And, uh, so what did you do in Germany? I worked, I got assigned to the S2, the Italian branch in the military, and I was their track driver. That's all I did was drive around, 330-some miles. I drove. Uh, I fell asleep, ran off the road, ran over a road sign one day. Because uh, we've been up for like the last two or three days and I barely could keep awake. And, uh, um, but that was uh, war games. So, what were you transporting? Uh, uh, radios, the communications. We had AM, FM radio, telescopes. We're the intelligence branch for the S2, so all the intelligence stuff comes through. Um, I got that was kind of interesting because we got a report I'm looking at of a helicopter. It's called Real World Affairs, and he was almost filed a false speaking in the Czechoslovakia. And the uh, helicopter pilot realized he said it the wrong way. They tried to lure him over the border, and he figured out he was headed the wrong way. And I got that telephone, and I wanted to keep that, but they wouldn't let me keep it. So. Did you bring home any souvenirs of any kind? Uh, yeah, I brought home some, um, I took the pictures and stuff and some leaflets. Um, what we could bring home, there were a lot of stuff you couldn't. Uh, um, sandals I brought home. And um, some ammunition, AK. Everybody's probably seen what a blank 22 round looks like. I found some of those. They're AK rounds. What the heck's a blank AK round? What's 60 guys for? Well, they use them to clean the weapons up. No, really. So I had some of those. Um, other than that, I didn't. Uh, I was just so glad to get out of the place. I wasn't really worried about what I could take with me. I had one bag and I just wanted to leave and go home. Now, when you got shipped to Germany, were you aware that you only had about four months left? Uh, yeah, I had less than that. I'm getting out four months early. Getting out in November, so March '71. Um, and I get over there, and um, I have three weeks left. And I'm going to get discharged, so I got the first flight back to the United States, and it's. Um, We had a file cabinet with us. It was all locked up. And I had all top ticket documents in there. And uh, going through customs, they wanted to look at it. And I said, I need to see your secret clearance first, your top ticket clearance. 
don't have one where you can't look at it. And um, so, and I got back to the post, and then, then I got, got out. When they brought you back from Germany, where did you go? Went back to Fort Riley, Kansas. And that's where you got discharged? That's where I got discharged out. That's what... Uh, How'd you get home from there, then? From there, uh, I went to... Uh, Got a ride to Lawrence, Kansas. Took a small plane to Kansas City. Got on a jet. Flew home. And that was another standby twenty bucks flight, or? Uh, probably. I don't really remember. But <laughs> they used to take advantage of every kind of discount you can get. You know, remember, I got two hundred sixty-five dollars a month. You know, forty years ago in the military, that wasn't very much money. And so. So you're back home. What do you do now? What do I do now? I applied for a disability for the hearing loss and stuff and got declined. No, nope, not getting nothing. All right, then uh, I'll forget that. I'm wife's pregnant and can have her first child. And my dad got me a job at the Chevrolet dealer. So I've been canning for like 35 years, mostly GM cars, Chevrolets and stuff. And um, four years ago, I reapplied for my disability again. He got granted to me this time. Whoa. So, um, to give me 10% disability, $123 a month in health care. Plus, I'm going to all that back? No. They didn't go back and. No. Nope. Um, plus, I'm going to go to college this month, start college, and they pay for that. So, you're still on the GI Bill? I'm what they call Chapter 31, with rehabilitation. What are you going to study? Pharmacy technician. Good for you. Great. Um, so I figured I'd still use my benefits, and it's all been approved. School's all paid for. Uh, my money's all been going to be direct deposited. So you pay for all tuition, plus I get 500 and. 47 a month, plus my disability money. Beautiful. And then, now, uh, he got you into, you said Chevrolet? My dad did. He knew the dealer, and I started to. Sh so they just had to teach you Yeah. whatever you needed to well, know? Well, they, they sent me to school. Down the yeah. tech center first opened. I went down, they had a six-week school. This is back when we didn't have computers in the car. They had point condensers, and that about it. You know, I didn't have anything. So I worked uh, Chevrolets for about 25 years and about six, seven years for Chrysler products. So when did you retire? When did you retire from that? Um, 23rd December. This year? Mm -hmm. And how did you get on to this school benefit? Well, I had the, the paperwork was there. You have 12 years to act on or expires. All right? You can't sit on forever. So um, I looked at it, I sent it in. They set up a meeting. If you have only a 10% disability, you have to prove you need to be rehabilitated. If you have a 20% more, you don't have to. So she agreed that I need to be rehabilitation. Um, she okay and everything. You just have to decide where do you want to go to school, what do you want to study. Plus, I had to do some testing for them. And then we come up with pharmacy technician because of demand for the uh, people for them. And um, so I'm going to Baker College in Auburn Hills. Start Saturday. So what do you think about that, going back to school at your age? Oh, boy. Um, at first, I was wondering, you know, geez, I'm going to be cramped in there probably. But uh, there's a lot of other older people in there, too. I was surprised how many people yep. are, are going back there. Because we all see what happened to the automobile business. I don't know if any of you people work for GM or any of that, and, uh, but it's, no, um, it's not ever going to be the same. So I just decided I'll use the benefits that the military, you know, gave me, and uh, then start a new career. All right. So how big is the family now? Uh, I have two sons, and uh, my girlfriend has a daughter. In between us, we have eight grandkids. Four oh, 
for girls and for boys. We got two of them, two oldest ones. One will be 15 this year, and the other will be 13. And then they go down to the four years old. So you still got a family, Jack? Yeah. Yeah, all my family's in Michigan. My parents are both dead now, but uh, I have a sister who lives in Ohio, and a brother who lives in Arizona. But the rest of them are here. And, uh, are all your immediate family still alive and alive? I have no aunts and uncles left anymore. But your brothers and sisters? Are... Just my brothers and sisters are all still alive. I see, I have a sister that's 72 and a brother that's 71. And I'm the middle kid. I'll be 60 next month, and then I have two younger brothers. So how long do you think this is going to take you to get your degree? Well, I have one year. You have one year. That's all you need? That's all the course for is one year. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I'm going to get a certificate. And then I'm going to take a test for a national certification. If I pass that, that means I can get a job in a hospital. But now that I can't. So that's the way to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me, Vera, for a minute. Yep. So that's what I'm hoping to is, uh, you know, a uh, job in the hospital um, or a VA clinic or something there, you know, work in the pharmacy. Were there any uh, benefits coming to you from uh, the auto industry when you left no. your work? Nothing. Nothing. They give you a they give you an early payout or something that you had. Some? The dealers I worked for. Yeah. No. Really, kind of left you high and dry. No. Huh? When the dealer I worked with here in Rochester Hills uh, lost the franchise. Okay. If they think they're going to get it back, I don't think they will. That's why I decided to use my benefits, and I told them that once it's okay, I'll be gone. So I stayed to the end of the year, just before Christmas, and that was it. Is there anything else about your time in the service that you'd like to share with us at this point? No, time? it's just uh, like those few things I'll never forget is the, um, the artillery there. You roll that one guy over, and the guy gets shot next to me. I'm never going to forget those things. Do you belong to any group uh, that you meet periodically? No. Uh -huh. No? And you don't, other than that one fellow that you said you went to see, you haven't maintained any contact with no. him? No. Uh -huh. I got contacted at one time back in the mid '90s about a reunion that I was setting up, and I never heard anything more about it. Uh -huh. And uh, well, the only reason I went to see Brian because we were the radio operator. We were both together, you know. I mean, we were the communications out there. We were your medical help. We were your food and, and everything else. So, and uh, so we were together, uh, you know, pretty much all the time. Except he had to stay his whole year, and I got out early just because of one day. And, uh, Somebody was watching over you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it uh, like say that I shouldn't be here because of that one incident, you know, the trench foot deal. Um, so it's the captain's decision. But I remember going seeing him in the hospital the 95th of that. Yeah, just both legs completely blown right off of the knee. And he got his rank the hard way by working his way up. He didn't go to college to become a captain. I mean, uh, with some of the officers that uh, Brian and I plowed their own night positions because half of them couldn't read a map. They just thought, Captain, he lost his legs. He knew how to read a map and everything. We were so confident with him. Um, you know, where we were at and all that, so. And, uh, Do you have some pictures you wanted to yeah, share with us? Yeah, uh, this, this probably okay. might be a little. 
Oh, he's got it in there. Yeah. I don't know what it will be able to um, take it off the screen. Yeah. Now, are these uh, pictures from when you were in Nam? Yep. Okay. Crossing the river. This is in the southern part. Can you can you turn that around so that we can try and? Uh, no, nah, I don't think we're going to do this at all. Yeah. I don't think so either, but. Okay, start at the start at the top one. I don't know that. Tell us about the top one. You're not gonna get that. No. Uh, That's well, a waste. Yeah, it, we were. We're not we're not getting anything on this. Yeah. No, you can't pick it up. Okay. So just just go ahead and tell us about them, and we'll uh, make. We're it. crossing the river there. We're down in the southern part. That, uh, so we had about both there to go across the river with. Is this free time? Huh? Is this free time that you're doing this? No, we were just moving on to another spot, you know. Uh -huh. um, some of the rivers were pretty deep. What river was that? I can't remember the name of okay. it. Okay. But we didn't like cross them. If I had my pack, my radio, and everything, that was 110 pounds. And then you get in these rivers, you don't know how deep they are. If you, go, if you had that on and went down the bottom, they're not going to get you back out. You're going to drown. Um. Is there a way to make that picture bigger? The contrast the between the two screens. Yeah. What's happening? This is compensating, and it won't. There, along the along the top of the button above the keys, there's a eject button. There's a, a eject symbol. Oh, there we go. This is the 25th Infantry. This is where I got. This is the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. There's me. Hmm. Maybe you can get that one. That's that a pretty big picture. 20 years old. What? You? No, it's unscrolling, so you're not so, going to be able to. This is up in by the DMZ, in the mountainous area up there. Oh, there's my pack. This is Lieutenant, he's dead. He got killed by a hand grenade. Who's that? I don't want to remember the name of that. Uh, he's also dead. Was that a deuce and a half that you were driving? Huh? Was that a deuce? No, that's over there in the, um, on the base there. Okay, we're talking about entertainment. You know, there's clubs there and stuff. Hmm. And that's up in the... Uh, Mountainous area there. Okay, this is where I was up north. That's the 23rd Infantry Division. There's radio. 
Um, I only had to carry seven rounds of ammunition. Everybody else had 14. Why only seven? Hmm? Why only seven rounds? Because I had to radio. Seven magazines, I mean. Oh, seven mags, okay. Yeah. Okay, this is South China Sea. We had one part of our base was there, so we had a beach and stuff. Um, now, who took this picture? I don't know. But like I say, this is what entertainment we had is, is you made yourself if it wasn't anything else. And uh, these are surrender leaflets. They would drop from planes and stuff. was my first eject button. He said there was one somewhere on here. Yep. It's right there. Now, when you rotated back from Nam, you were in the 23rd? I was in the 23rd. And then they sent you, instead of going to Carson, you went to Riley in Kansas? Mm -hmm. Were you assigned to the 1st then? Yeah. Or were you still in the 23rd there? I was in the 1st then. Okay. <clears throat> I got assigned to, uh, did I say the S2? I yeah. passed this through, and they said, hey, you've got a real fair driver's license. Yeah, I never thought about it at the time, you know, but they look at my records and said, okay, they need a track driver for the S2, and that's what I did. I mean, I didn't do any paperwork. You're the captain, you know, on the field, let's go today, we need to go here, let's go, we'll get the Jeep and we're gone, you know. What's now, a track driver mean? And that's what I did there, you know, you know, just drove around. What's a truck driver mean? Me? What does that mean? I mean, I drove an APC, Armored Personal Carrier. And what we had with us, we were the S2, we were the intelligence. We had captain, lieutenant, sergeant, and me. We had all the radio communications for intelligence purposes. We had AM radio, FM radio. We could log into any radio band in Germany that we wanted to. We got all the top secret documents kept with us for the, because we were playing what they call reforgers, war games. So we carried all the top secret and secret classified documents with us. Um, nobody was allowed to go in there unless you had clearance. One thing I had to get was a top secret clearance when I got into the S2, which they took care of that for me. Um, and then that, that, that was my job. So. Dave? Okay, there aren't any more. Ready? No, I said. I say the rest of them I gave to my son to keep. Um, and if anybody wanted any more, I could always mm -hmm. produce for you and everything and stuff like that because I don't know on, you know, what. Would be six, eight months or so for this is available. But uh, I'm never going to forget uh, my military experience ever. Uh, it gives you a different uh, view of life and everything. Um, especially when you, you know, I come close to death a couple times. And, uh, um, I can understand them people over in Afghanistan and stuff, you know, every time I see it on there, and it's just, it just reminds me what I went through too and stuff. And they're done that, huh? Yep. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, other than that, not offhand, I don't, other than my experience and stuff. Say I got out of the Army four months early, 
Um, that's for the reason they told me because of so many people coming back from Vietnam. This is 1970. And they were all the outfits were starting to wind down and now running out of space. And uh, um, the reason you got released early because you have combat experience. If you wouldn't have had that, they might have had to spend my two years there. I got drafted. I didn't listen here. So, how come you won't eject here? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dave. I mm -hmm. appreciate your. Well, you're entirely welcome. And uh, um, they say it's a